And you know, Christy, something happened a long time ago in Haiti, and uh, people might not want to talk about it. They were under the heel of the French, uh, you know, Napoleon the Third and whatever. And they got together and swore a pact to the devil. They said, we will serve you if you'll get us free from the French. Mm. True story. And so the devil said, okay, it's a deal. And uh, they kicked the French out. You know, the Haitians revolted and got themselves free. But ever since, they have been cursed by, by one thing after the other, desperately poor. And absolutely none of what Pat Robertson said in this clip is true. Yes, the slaves of Haiti did free themselves from the French, but they absolutely did not make a pact with the devil. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, a very, very special thank you to all of our patrons and our producers on this channel. Without you guys, we would not be able to do what we do. If you would like to join our Patreon community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today on our deep dive into voodoo, we are going to be talking about the Haitian Revolution. Normally on Mondays, we do a Monday mystery. And as most of you know, currently we are looking through missing people from national parks. However, this episode specifically on the Haitian Revolution, on our deep dive into the practice of voodoo has been a very long time coming. In fact, I have been sitting on this research for many, many, many weeks now. And if you joined us on Aquarius Rising Africa last Monday, you saw us briefly speak about this event in our human history. Now the reason why I've been sitting on this information and have not made a video yet going over this research is because I've been dealing with some pretty scary stuff off camera. As you know, many of you know, there is another person, another YouTuber out there that has called me a witch and then went on to say he wanted to decapitate witches. I take threats to my life very, very seriously, and therefore decided to hold off on releasing any more voodoo deep dives until I felt safer. Well, at this point, I feel like I'm pretty divinely protective, and I do feel like this person who has been making these threats will bring no harm to me or anybody else that was also called a witch on his channel. Now, as many of you know, especially those of you who are from the Deep South like I am, you know, again, that voodoo, hoodoo, all these faiths that originated in Africa have made their way over specifically to the southeastern part of the Deep South. They arrived here by way of the slave trade. Now, like most religions, voodoo has many different branches. Just like in Christianity, there's many different denominations. And the most popular form of voodoo in New Orleans is Haitian voodoo. This is because in the late 1700s, there was the Haitian Revolution. During this time, many of the slaves were actually taken out of Haiti and brought into New Orleans, the port of New Orleans, in order to keep them enslaved by the French. At this point, the port of New Orleans was not a part of the United States. That would not come until the early 1800s with the Louisiana Purchase. Now, at the beginning of this video, I played a clip from Pat Robertson from the 700 Club. Now, I'm not a fan of Pat Robertson. In fact, I have a lot of suspicions about who he truly serves. But I'm going to tell you right now that there was no pact made with the devil from the people, the slaves of Haiti. And what's so ironic is that right before the Haitian Revolution happened, another revolution happened, the American Revolution. We acknowledge that the start of the American Revolution was 1776. And if you've watched a lot of my earlier videos, you know that 
America, the United States, really wasn't truly established and on solid ground as its own nation until 1791. Well, in 1791, the Haitians also revolted. For someone like Pat Robertson, the patriots of the American colonist were heroes who fought off the British, who wanted to keep taxing them and bossing them around on their own nation. They were a group of people, of rebels, of badasses, who decided that they didn't need a monarchy to tell them what to do. Instead, they were going to self-govern and self-elect. In my opinion, 1776 was truly the marker of what we now call the Great Awakening. But for someone like Pat Robertson, who would glorify the patriots of the colonies, he will then turn around and demonize the people of Haiti. The people of Haiti were doing the exact same thing that the colonists were doing. They were trying to get a tyrannical government out of their land. And so not only is the information of them selling their soul or making a pact to the devil incorrect, it's also pretty racist. Because if you're a true person of God, if you're a true person who serves the light, you know that all people, all human beings, are equal in the eyes of God. Yes, it's true that voodoo did play a part in this revolution, but we have been lied to so much about certain things that it's of the utmost importance that we start to re-examine what exactly happened and what the practice of voodoo really is. The island of Hispaniola is an island in the Caribbean Sea. Again, if you've been following along on this channel, we've actually spoken about Hispaniola quite a few times. This was the island that Christopher Columbus discovered in 1492. Now again, if you joined us on Aquarius Rising Africa, you probably heard me say that if you actually believe Christopher Columbus found this land, this continent, these islands in 1492 as the first white person, then you've got a lot more waking up to do. I believe personally, with a lot of evidence and proof, that this continent had been known about for a while by the powers that be in Europe. And we know for sure that there were tribal nations of Africa that absolutely knew about the Americas. Why? Because prior to Christopher Columbus's journey to the New World, he had been in Africa where he had heard stories about a great continent that lay across the sea. So in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and he landed on the island that he named Hispaniola or the Spanish island. On this island was the first three official European settlements. The first was founded in 1492. Again, this was La Navidad. In 1493, La Isabella was founded. And in 1498, Santo Domingo was founded. And of course, this is currently the capital of the Dominican Republic. Now in 1492, when Christopher Columbus first landed in Hispaniola, he was looking for gold. Gold was not necessarily something he found on the island though. Instead, what he found would end up being an even better resource for these European empires, and this was sugarcane. Not only would this sugarcane make the empires of Europe very wealthy, but it also would require a lot of manual labor to process the sugarcane. Thus, we have the introduction of the slave trade through Hispaniola. Now again, if you have been here for a while, the last time we spoke about Hispaniola, we were talking about Ponce de Leon and the infamous Fountain of Youth. Because apparently the inhabitants of Hispaniola, the people that were already there on the island, told Ponce de Leon about this mythical fountain that was just a little bit north of them that would give you eternal life. If you missed that episode, I will place that down in the description box below. So in 1503, Spain started importing slaves from Africa to again work the land. Because of the immense wealth that the sugarcane provided the empire of Spain, both France and England wanted in on the piece of pie. This little island would become the centerpiece of economic profit for these three empires that were constantly at each other's necks for this new land. Now we know that most of the monarchs in Europe are all interrelated. They all marry each other. I mean, really, they're just one big family. But that's especially true with Spain and France. 
especially when we get into the House of Bourbon. We see both the House of Bourbon in both empires. And we, again, we have talked about this on our deep dives into New Orleans. Even though we see these battles going back and forth between France and Spain, it really is kind of a sleight of hand, a, a trick to destabilize the population while this one family profits from all of the rewards. In 1670, the French started bringing in even more slaves to the island of Hispaniola. And in 1697, a treaty was signed that divided Hispaniola into two different halves. We have on one side the Dominican Republic, and on the other side we have Haiti. And this is exactly as it is even to this day. The Spanish governed the Dominican Republic, while the French governed Haiti. Over on the French side of Haiti, the black population greatly outnumbered the white population. We again had the same situation over in New Orleans. And so we had publications such as the Code Noir, which was basically a law book for how to govern your slaves. And even though no one living the life of a slave was living a happy life, the slaves of Haiti had it the worst. Not only was it labor intensive to work the fields, but because they outnumbered the white people greatly, the white people then had to be that much more brutal towards their slaves. In fact, the lifespan of a slave in Haiti at this time was three to seven years. Now, I don't think it's fair for me to actually just call it the white people because, well, we're gonna get into that as we get into the Haitian Revolution. We're talking about the actual slave owners. We know that in life, nothing is really black and white. In fact, most things in life fall into shades of gray. And as we'll get into with what actually happened with the Haitian Revolution, not all the white people, the French people, Polish, German people that happened to be on the island were necessarily a part of this massive of these black Africans. As many people know, over in Europe, especially within Europe, aristocratic families, arranged marriages were very, very common. This wasn't just done within royalty, it was literally done everywhere. And so if we think about the situation on the island, especially with a lot of these white French families, you're looking at a lot of wives, children, people that were also kind of placed in this situation almost like the slaves themselves. Yes, they did not live the same lives as the slaves did, but a lot of them were forced into these houses with these men who were not the nicest of people. In fact, a lot of the slaves that were brought in from Africa to Haiti called the slave masters I kid you not. Now, 10 years ago, I probably wouldn't have taken this very seriously, but given what we know now about the powers that be, I take this very seriously, that they refer to the masters and the traders as This is something very important to remember as we get deeper into what voodoo actually is. Now, just like in New Orleans, when the slaves were brought into Haiti, they were kind of forced to take on this Catholic faith. They were baptized into this faith. However, that did not strip them of their local culture and the faith that they were taught growing up. And this is where we get voodoo from. Now, if you've been watching our prior episodes on deep dives into voodoo, you know that voodoo is not necessarily the right term for this faith. The right term is voodoo which means pure light. From all the resources that I've used in studying this faith, including speaking with people that I know who practice this faith, voodoo is like a spiritual science. It's marrying the idea of complete trust in God with working with the elements of nature. This is something that's common in a lot of indigenous religions and faiths. Even in the European indigenous religions, they worked with herbs and they learned how to move with the tides of nature. And as many of you know, the word sorcery in the Bible, well, that original word was pharmakia. If that gets you any indication of how everything's been twisted and inverted. As we're building up to the Haitian Revolution, we're going to talk about a couple of characters 
within this timeline. The first person we're going to talk about was a man named Mackendall. Now, from my understanding, Mackendall was born a slave but ended up freeing himself. As we've spoken about in prior episodes, there was a way under the French government for the slaves to eventually free themselves. That was one of the things that was very different from the English slave trade. Now, if you're new to our deep dive into New Orleans, into all these things, then I will put the New Orleans playlist down in the description box below so you can go back and review some of that stuff if that's not familiar to you. Because a lot of the characters that we're gonna look at going forward in this episode as well as in other episodes were slaves that had freed themselves through one of the laws in the Code Noir. Now, if you put yourself in Mackendall's shoes, here he is, he's freed himself, but he's watching his fellow people basically... Now, I'm not going to get into the specifics of what they did to the slaves in Haiti because it's a little iffy on YouTube, but I will, again, link the Aquarius Rising Africa episode in the description box below where you can hear us speak about some of that there. So because of Mackendall's understanding of herbs and how to work with plant medicine, he taught some of these slaves how to create concoctions that would cause their masters to, shall we say, leave the earth plain. In fact, it is believed that Mackendall himself was responsible for the passing of 6,000 Frenchmen. Now, I don't know if that number is accurate. This was in the 1700s. So in 1757, Mackendall gave a prophecy of the revolution to come. Because of these prophecies and because of the things that he was teaching his people, a group of slaves that had kind of gone into some Stockholm syndrome where they were like protecting their masters, which is very common, that does happen a lot, ended up turning Mackendall in. And Mackendall ended up being executed for all his crimes against the French slave owners. Before his execution, Mackendall said that he was gonna come back as a mosquito. Well, they laughed at that. How was he gonna come back as a mosquito and like hurt people? I mean, hello, malaria. And that actually ended up happening a little bit later. There was this huge outbreak of malaria. So was that Mackendall? Who knows? But the one thing we really get from the story of Mackendall is that the slaves that had been brought to Haiti were definitely starting to get fed up with the circumstances that they found themselves in. And that brings us to the next person that we're going to speak about. And this is my favorite of all the characters I've studied in this whole story. And this is the man named Duty Bookman. Now, Duty Bookman was a voodoo priest that was originally in Jamaica. Duty Bookman had caused the British Empire that governed Jamaica a lot of problems. It seems that he and his whole family really believed in this idea of like freedom and were really, you know, starting these resistance against the slave owners over in Jamaica. And so the British, you know, they thought that, hey, you know what? We know what will break duty bookmen. We'll sell them to the French. Because as I said, Haiti and the French already had a reputation for being some of the most brutal slave masters in this whole industry. So at 13 years old, Duty Bookman was sent to Haiti. Now he got the last name of Bookman because when he got there, he actually had a copy of the Quran tied around his belt. When he refused to give up the Quran to his new owners, they ripped the book from him and burned it in front of him. But the young 13-year-old Duty Bookman would not be broken by the French. In fact, he was instrumental in actually lighting the fire that would start the Haitian Revolution. He did this with a woman named Cecilia Fatiman. We've spoken about the roles of women in voodoo in previous episodes, but I want to make this very, very clear. What I have learned from the voodoo faith is that the voodoo faith does recognize a divine masculine and a divine feminine, just like we're supposed to have in the Christian faith. We're supposed to have Yahshua, as we know him as Jesus, his real name was Yahshua, and the Magdalene. There's supposed to be an equal balance between the feminine 
and the masculine. And we see this again within the voodoo religion. Cecilia was what we call a mamba. Haitian mambos are leaders in the voodoo temples and they also provide healing work, which is what Cecilia was known for. She was the daughter of an enslaved African woman and of a white Frenchman. Now, allegedly her father, this white Frenchman, was of Croatian royalty. But when Cecilia was born in 1771, she was immediately sold into slavery. Now, leading up to this revolution and this very powerful ceremony with Judy Bookman and Cecilia that started the Haitian Revolution, not only were the slaves mistreated heavily by their masters, but they also had a lot of mind scrambling done to them. You see, within the faith of voodoo, there was this idea of the transmigration of the soul. This concept is very common. We talk about this concept in yoga a lot. This is also a concept that's in the Christian faith as well, meaning that the soul is eternal. The soul never dies. The soul just moves on. But within the voodoo faith, because of this really heavy idea of the transmigration of the soul, there wasn't a lot of fear around mortality. And so for a lot of these slaves that were brought into Haiti, sometimes they would just end their own lives instead of be subject to the hands of these slave masters because they knew, they knew that they would just go on to another existence. Because of this, the slave masters started telling them that to commit was a sin. You see, my friends, this is where this comes from. This idea that taking one's own life is a sin, it doesn't come from the Bible. It doesn't come from anywhere but a psychopath who wants to try to control people. So on August 14th of 1791, Duty Bookman and Cecilia held a voodoo ceremony in a local bayou. This is where Pat Robertson will tell you they made a pact with the devil. But that is not so. Now, the thing about voodoo is that, again, they learn to work with nature. They learn to respect nature, to understand animals within the animal kingdom. And so practicing their faith in the bayou, in the swamps where there's alligators, was not that big of a deal to the voodoo people. They respected the alligators and the alligators respected them. They also knew that this area was safe for them because the white people wouldn't come near the swamps. Now on this night of August 14th of 1791, Duty Bookman and Cecilia spoke about all these prophecies. The Mackendall prophecy, their own prophecies of a revolution to come, of freedom to come, freedom for them. They encouraged people to get brave. They knew that the white slave owner only understood force, and so therefore they would have to reciprocate with force back to these slave owners. For four years, Cecilia herself had been encouraging people to break free of this life of misery. They talked about using everything at their disposal, weaponizing everything, this idea of guerrilla warfare. They also told everybody in the swamp that they would wait seven days before they started the revolution. There were many reasons for this. One, they had to get prepared, but another reason they needed seven days, another part of their preparation was to make sure that they could get the white people that were good into a safe place. When I learned about this part of the Haitian Revolution, I got very emotional because that shows the level of integrity that these slaves had, the level of discernment that they had, the fact that their lives were met with such hardship, but they were able to understand that some of these white people, especially the wives of some of these masters, were just as caught as they were. And they made a pact that they would do what they could to protect those that had not hurt them. You see, this was not a battle of black versus white. This was not anything to do with race. This was everything to do with good versus evil. Because a lot of the slaves were not educated, they did not know how to count. So the ones that could count 
went and collected seven pebbles for each person. Every day they were told to throw a pebble out. And by the time they had no more pebbles left, that was the time to act. To close out this ceremony, Duty Bookman gave his famous prayer. And in my opinion, this prayer tells you exactly what you need to know about the voodoo faith. And before I read this prayer out to you, I ask you to question, who was the God that the slaves were worshiping? And who was the God that the slave owners were worshiping? Because in my mind, it seems that the slaves that practice voodoo were worshiping the God of love. And the slave owners were worshiping the God of darkness. The God who created the earth, who created the sun that gives us light. The God who holds up the ocean, who makes the thunder roar. Our God who has ears to hear. You who are hidden in the clouds, who watches us from where you are. You see all that the white has made us suffer. The white man's God asks him to commit crimes, but the God within us wants to do good. Our God, who is so good, so just, orders us to avenge our wrongs. It's our God who will direct our arms and bring us victory. It's our God who will assist us. We should throw away the image of the white man's God who is so pitiless. Listen to the voice of liberty that sings in all our hearts. And in my opinion, it seems that the God that assisted the slaves in the Haitian Revolution was the exact same God that had previously assisted the colonists in the Americas in their revolution. Once the revolution began, the number one mission from the French military was to find Duty Bookman. And on November 7th of 1791, Duty Bookman was indeed captured. He was executed by the French and his head was placed on a stake for all the other slaves to see. The French thought that this would scare off any other people and maybe quell the revolution, but the thing is, is it only pissed the people off more. And day by day, the slaves would walk by and rub the head of duty bookmen in respect. I guess it's safe to say that at this point, nothing could stop what was coming. The next person, important person in the Haitian revolution is a man named Toussaint Louis Vecher. Now my French is terrible, and any French that I'm familiar with typically is French coming from New Orleans, and so it's probably not exactly like the French you would hear in France or even in Canada, but more of like a Southern French. So I apologize if these names are not accurate in the way that I pronounce them, but I'm going to go ahead and call this man just Toussaint by his first name. Now Toussaint is considered to be the father of Haiti. He was a Haitian general and the most prominent leader of the Haitian Revolution. He had been born a slave between 1739 and 1746, but was about 50 years old when the revolution began. Now this is pretty incredible to me because 50 years old nowadays is actually really young. I mean, maybe it's because I'm 38 that I find 50 to be really young, but um, but it, it is. I mean, I know a lot of people who are 50 who look more fit and healthy than they probably did at 28. Different time, right? But 50 for this time was not young. And so the fact that he was able to be such a prominent general in this revolution is really impressive. Now it is said that Toussaint had been born a slave and he was born a pretty submissive slave. And so the slave owners of the French military actually really liked Toussaint as, as a slave. He did become a free man around the age of 30 and he went forward within a military career and became very Europeanized. He actually adapted the Christian faith. He he dressed very European. He Everything he understood, he had learned from the French. And this is going to come in handy because in order to defeat the French, he needed to understand the French. He understood European warfare. And in fact, Toussaint became one of the first Africans to actually become a general 
for the French military. And I'm sure the role Toussaint played in the Haitian Revolution made Napoleon, who was the Emperor of France at that time, very, very nervous. Now, I do need to point out that during this time as well, Napoleon was also going into Egypt and trying to clean Egypt out of all of its information. This is really interesting, and I find this so obvious now. It's like once you see it, you can't unsee it, that these... Um, people, this bunch of group, the dark cult, as Janine calls them, that they were doing everything they could to get rid of any information that would allow humans to understand who we truly are, where we truly come from, and what the real God is like. Hence why they started smear campaigns and propaganda against voodoo, which we're going to get into a little bit more at the end of this episode. But in 1802, I think Napoleon kind of had his oh shit moment when he realized that Toussaint was now kind of in charge of the military and like this was this really good general who knew everything about the French military and now he was probably going to kick their ass and the French were going to like lose this revolution. And so in 1802, Napoleon sent a middleman to meet up with Toussaint in Haiti and offer him a crap ton of money to turn in the other leaders of the Haitian Revolution. This is what this group of people have. This is what they do all the time. They bribe you. If they can't blackmail you, they're going to bribe you. But it didn't work with Toussaint. And guys, he was going to offer Toussaint 1 million francs. Again, in 1802. I mean, Toussaint would have been like one of the richest guys ever, but Toussaint had integrity and he said no. At that point, I think Toussaint realized that he probably had Napoleon in the palm of his hands. If Napoleon was that desperate to try to squash this revolution and get Toussaint on his side, that he would offer him all this money, he, he probably figured like, ah, easy peasy, this is done. And so Toussaint goes ahead and writes a constitution for the land of Haiti. In this constitution, he bans slavery. When Napoleon received the copy of the Constitution and the request from the Haitians, again, exactly like what had happened in the American Revolution with the Declaration of Independence, it's the same thing, same thing. Here's our demand. We're breaking up with you. We want to be free. Sign it. Let's negotiate this and let's be done with it. But when Napoleon got this, he decided that he was going to not give in to Toussaint. And in fact, he tricked Toussaint. He decided to invite Toussaint to France to negotiate gentleman to gentleman, man to man. But this again was a trick because when Toussaint got to France under the impression that Napoleon respected him enough that they would have this man to man talk about the demands and the freedom of Haiti, they arrested Toussaint and they threw him in jail. And in fact, they starved him. They starved him. They starved him. What an awful way to go to be that hungry to pass away because you're in this jail in France and you don't have food. Toussaint's last words were basically that his passing would not stop the revolution. And in fact, I think his passing probably pissed the Haitian people off even more. At this point, Napoleon was literally out for blood. Napoleon sent some of his most brutal military men to Haiti to basically take everything in their path. Men, women, children, they trained dogs to attack all sorts of stuff. They used the sulfate on the island to basically gas people. I mean, hello, we've seen this done less than 100 years ago as well in um, another situation on this earth. And as Duty Bookman and Cecilia had said in that fateful night of August 14th of 1791, we have to meet their force with force. So the bloodier the French got, the bloodier the Haitians got. And so enters the last character we're going to speak about, and this is Jean Jacquin Dessalines. Now, the last name Dessalines means a free man of color. It is believed that Jean Jacquin Dessalines had been purchased by another slave when he was a child. And so, a bit like Toussaint, he had grown up. He didn't spend that much time as a slave, so he had kind of grown up with this education where he was learning things about the French military. And like Toussaint, he dressed European and had a lot of the same knowledge. Jean Jacquis had learned lessons from Toussaint. Don't, don't ever, ever give the French any more credit than they deserve when it comes to the trickery of war. And when I say the French, I hope you guys understand, I'm, I mean the government, the military, not the people. The French people are awesome. I love the French people. I have French in my DNA, my ancestry. So I think we know that 
by now, right? Like we're talking about the government and we know now that the governments are all in cahoots together and us little people are the ones that are getting screwed over. So please know when I say the French, that's who I'm referring to. It is noted that before Jean-Jacques Dessalines basically went apeshit on the French, he said, we're gonna take care of these cannibals. I mean, how obvious is this, guys? How obvious is this? <sighs> the people who had made a pact with the devil, in my opinion, were the slave owners, not the Haitians. Jean Jacques showed no mercy. And in one day, 7,000 Frenchmen surrendered to Jean Jacques Dessalines. And on November 18th of 1803, the Haitians won the Haitian Revolution. This had been the biggest slave revolt since Spartacus in 71 BC. The only difference is they actually freed themselves. They officially became the first black republic. And on January 1 of 1804, Haiti declared itself an independent country. In its constitution, he granted all the people, black, white, whatever, citizenship, banning slavery, and working on this crazy idea of self-governing. They even sent people to other countries like Ecuador and Venezuela to help them end their slavery. But the only problem is, even though they won the revolution, at this point, we were looking at a David and Goliath moment. And at this point in history, it wasn't time yet for David to take down Goliath. All the other empires, especially the ones that were governed by this group, this bunch, this 1%, did not recognize Haiti as its own country. This meant that Haiti could not trade with other nations. And without the trade, there was no money to be made. Haiti itself on this island was so rich with resources, but because they couldn't utilize those resources within this global world, they became extremely poor. Not only that, but the Catholic Church itself decided to go after Jean-Jacques Dessalines, and they executed him, and they scattered his body all around, kind of as like one big F.U. from this dark cult to the people who dared to want their own freedom. The women of Haiti gathered together and collected Jean-Jacques Dessalines' body in order to give him a proper, respectable burial. Over time, the nation of Haiti was hit with reparation taxes. The French decided that these people didn't have a right to demand their freedom, and so therefore they were going to force Haiti to pay them back money for them wanting to be free. Like, how dare these people not allow us to own them? They need to pay us money for that. That's what happened to Haiti. And over time, this same group of people you know who I'm talking about, have continued to go to Haiti to utilize their resources, to utilize their people, and to take everything from them. Even just recently, there was a scandal involving a nonprofit here in the United States in regards to some of the young people of Haiti. And I think you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. Before the revolution ended, about 10,000 Frenchmen took their slaves into New Orleans. The stories of the horrors of Haiti ran through the circles of New Orleans. And the Haitian people did something that was pretty smart. They knew that there was a smear campaign against their faith. They knew that the propaganda machine was going, trying to convince the white people that this faith from Africa was bad. When again, in my opinion, it seems like everything had been inverted. So the Haitian slaves in New Orleans started to act on this. They started to dramatize the ceremonies in order to scare the slave owners away. What better way to protect yourself than to actually have people believe that you are powerful in black magic? But having someone believe you are powerful in black magic doesn't mean that you actually are powerful in black magic. And as I have found in most of my research, most of voodoo is actually pretty good and worships a god of light. And I'm hoping as we move forward in our time on this earth, that Haiti will once again be restored, that its natural resources will be returned to it, and that Haiti, like all the countries, will become free.
because now is the time for the David and Goliath moment. All right, guys, thank you so much for sitting through that. Please leave me your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. We've got more things to look at when it comes to voodoo and New Orleans. I know there's some big people like Marie Laveau that you guys are really excited about, but she's coming. Trust me, she's coming. All right, this afternoon, I believe I have a round table with Katherine Edwards again. That was so fun last time. So I will be filming that later this afternoon. Hopefully we'll have that up for you guys either this evening or by tomorrow. Tomorrow from 1 to 3 p.m., I will be back on the Dark Outpost with David Zublik to once again continue reading through the Yoga Sutras and to look at Michael and Debbie Pearl and their very toxic theology. We will probably be discussing the Josh Duggar trial too and all those outcomes. Again, with David Zublik's platform, it is a private platform, so we don't have to worry about things like censorship. So if that's something that you would like to participate in, it's also a live show, so you can actually call in if you want to. Some people have called in in the past. So that's kind of cool. So you can go into the description box below and follow that link. I believe on Wednesday evening, I will be back with Turn the Page uh, with a woman, another woman named Janine. I think Tarot by Janine and I are going to be doing that show together. I think that's 7 p.m. Wednesday evening. I'm not 100% sure, but I will check with Janine at Turn the Page so I get the proper times for you guys so I can put that in the community tab for you. Again, that will be, I think, a call-in show, so you'll be able to call in and actually talk to us and ask questions and all, all that good stuff. So I will keep you guys posted on that. Next Monday, I will be back on Aquarius Rising Africa, where we're going to talk about some of the origins of Christmas. So, all right, guys. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I know this month has been very challenging. This whole, these whole few years have been a little challenging, to be honest, but I do believe we're towards the end. So I hope you all are having a wonderful holiday season, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.